Thank you very much, Yolanda and Kate. I am Elizabeth Wilson, um, Director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society and Professor in the Department of Environmental Studies. And I'm excited to be here today to have these conversations about equity and justice and sustainability within our energy systems. And joining us in conversation today, we couldn't have a more um, knowledgeable and engaged guest than um, our, our, our speaker today, Nancy Sutley, the Chief Sustainability Officer of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And when you're thinking about energy justice and when you're thinking about the creation of sustainable energy systems in the future, um, having Nancy Sutley as Chief Sustainability Officer really helps to highlight the importance of this role, both in Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, otherwise known as LADWP, but also with building, it builds on her rich experience. So as Chief Sustainability Officer, um, um, this position reports directly to the general manager. And in this role, Ms. Sutley oversees the department's energy efficiency goals, environmental affairs, sustainability initiatives, and the electrification of the transportation network. She initiated LADWP's corporate sustainability programs, including Green Team and commissioning the headquarters, the John Ferraro Building, which is the lead gold facility. Before joining LADWP in 2014, Ms. Setley served as chair of the White House Council of Environmental Quality. And under her leadership, the council played a central role in shepherding the Obama administration's signature environmental projects and was one of the chief architects of the Obama 2013 Climate Action Plan. She has an extensive background in public service, including posts as deputy mayor and environment for energy and environment with the city of Los Angeles and, and um, um, has education from Cornell and also Harvard in public policy. With that, we're going to um, invite Ms. Sutley to speak with us about her career, about different aspects of it. We'll then open it up for Q&A. If you have questions, please type them in the chat and we'll be having a question and answer session. I'm gonna turn my camera off. And Ms. Sutley, thank you so much for being part of the conversation today. And we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing your remarks and engaging with you. Great, thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here and uh, glad to join all of you and appreciate uh, all the acknowledgements. So I, I'm gonna start just a little bit by describing uh, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and, and some of our initiatives around sustainability. Uh, so, I know a number of you are from Los Angeles or the LA area. Uh, LADWP, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, is a department of the city of Los Angeles and is the largest uh, municipally owned utility in the US. Uh, so, um, you know, Southern California in particular has a, has a um, strong uh, history of public ownership of, of infrastructure. Uh, and uh, particularly around utilities, both uh, water and power. So uh, we joined a number of our colleagues around uh, Southern California um, as municipal utilities. So uh, other cities in Los Angeles County and throughout uh, Southern California are also uh, are public power. Um, and in California, about 20% of um, residents are served by public power. Uh, so that gives us some unique um, sort of responsibility, I guess, around sustainability because it really reflects the values of, of, of the community and the public policy goals uh, of the state and the city. Um, California was one of the first states to adopt a greenhouse gas emission reduction law and now has uh, enshrined in state law greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Uh, and, as well as renewable energy goals. So to get to, to have uh, the utilities in California get to 100% renewable energy by 2045. Uh, and so uh, Los Angeles also has uh, under Mayor Garcetti adopted a uh, Los Angeles's Green New Deal, uh, which strives for carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, and that includes the sort of five zeros, um, uh, zero carbon grid, zero carbon transportation, zero carbon buildings, 
uh, zero wasted water and zero waste. So LADWP will play a big role in, uh, in most of those goals. Um, and um, last night, uh, Mayor Garcetti uh, delivered his uh, 2021 State of the City address and, and uh, laid out some additional goals for LADWP um, and announced that we would, uh, we would uh, meet the Biden administration's challenge to uh, have a carbon-free grid, not by 2050, but by 2035 and that we would get to 80% renewable energy by 2030 uh, and 97% greenhouse gas free electricity uh, by 2030. Uh, so you talked about a number of other things but we can go into that a little bit later if you want. Elizabeth, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Do you want to ask the next question? Yes, I'll do that. Hold on just a moment. Thank you. Um, Nancy, could you talk a little bit about what you see as some of the biggest sustainability, equity, and human health concerns facing LA residents today? I'm sure. I, I think, let me um, sort of start with the obvious one, which is, um, you know, dealing with the COVID pandemic. Um, and that has a direct sort of bearing on, um, uh, on of course, all of our residents in, in Los Angeles and everyone across the country. and and obviously the, both the uh, public health and the uh, economic uh, and, um, you know, and just direct impact on, on families and businesses across Los Angeles is, is something, of course, that uh, all communities are, are, are striving to address. But for, uh, as far as LADWP, of course, you know, concerns that um, given the economic hardship that has accompanied uh, COVID, you know, how do we help our customers address that? Um, and so uh, we, like many utilities across the country, um, instituted a moratorium on uh, shutting, shut, shut offs for, for non-payment and recognizing that, uh, you know, during a time of crisis and particularly when people um, were supposed to be staying at home that we, we really should not be cutting off their water or their power uh, for, for non-payment. Um, and so, you know, trying to figure out how we address that going forward, because we want to be in a position to 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 make the sort of the transition um, uh, back to our uh, more economic strength, um, something that that folks can that can manage. Uh, and there's 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 some constraints around that, which we can get into a, a, in a little bit. Um, and then sort of both immediate and long-term is really, you know, addressing the climate crisis. So uh, LADWP, we are um, a vertically integrated utility, which means we generate, um, transmit and distribute uh, the power that we supply to, to Los Angeles. And so how we uh, transition from a utility that looked like very much like a very traditional utility, largely dependent on fossil fuels um, to generate electricity to one that is fossil fuel free um, is, is a, a major undertaking and something that um, we are working very hard on. Uh, so right now um, we get about um, 35 and 40% of our electricity from renewable energy sources. Um, and uh, we, uh, but we still own one coal plant that will shut down in 2025. Um, and uh, is that the plant in Utah? That is the plant in Utah. The um, Rocky Mountain Power plant. Uh, it's called Intermountain Power. Intermountain yeah. Power. Yeah. I mean, it's really power. amazing to think that LA is electrically, or Utah is electrically part of LA. Yeah. Well, interesting. I mean, kind of a, just a side note on the history mm -hmm. of that, which is you know, when LA in the 50s and 60s and 70s mm -hmm. was growing very quickly, 
um, you know, LA is still the has still is the worst smog of any place in the country. And so, yep. in a way, the uh, trying to to um, you know sort of grow the grid to meet the need without adding to the pollution burden in Los Angeles uh, drove LADWP to look outside of Los Angeles. Um, and so, at one time uh, in the not so recent past, we actually owned interests in. Uh, a, a several other coal-fired power plants outside of Los Angeles, in, in addition to the Intermountain plant, both in Nevada and in Arizona. Um, and so the, uh, so the, the plan is to tr transition that Utah plant initially to, to run on natural gas and then to convert it to run on 100% uh, green hydrogen. So um, there's some unique characteristics of that plant that, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. make that a real possibility. Uh, as well as um, what, what we also have at that plant in southwestern Utah is a lot of um, high voltage transmission lines that bring power from Utah into Southern California. And we sort of envision it um, as a renewable energy hub because mm -hmm. we bring in mm -hmm. uh, renewable energy, not just from, from that part of Utah, but really bring it in from other parts of the West into, into Utah and then eventually to Southern California. We'd um, had a conversation with First Wind, who was one of the wind projects that developed off to use this HVDC lines down into LA a few years ago. So I can really appreciate that LA vision and how you're really balancing a lot of interest between your very aggressive renewable goals, but also the uh, opposition often of the unions within Los Angeles against building power out of state. Um, and I'm wondering how LADWP walks that line between self-production within LA and bringing in power from other parts of the country. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, LADWP, uh, you know, we, we are, our, most of our employees are represented by the uh, IBW, the International mm -hmm. Brotherhood of Electrical mm -hmm. Workers. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and, because of that partnership between LADWP and IBW, you know, LADWP has been uh, able to provide um, really good jobs for people in Los Angeles and give uh, generations of Angelinos a, a road into the middle class. Absolutely. Um, um, through these jobs. So that is something for sure we want to preserve going forward. Uh, so, you know, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, DWP and IBW entered into an agreement where uh, even if we were to sign contracts uh, to purchase a renewable energy, so where we mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily own the projects, that we would always have the option to uh, to purchase the uh, project. And, and part of it has to do with, um, uh, not to get too into the weeds here, but uh, the way that um, you know renewable energy projects receive tax credit mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. both production and investment tax credits and because we're a public agency we cannot directly take it right of those. right so the, these deals are sort of structured so that we and our and our customers our ratepayers get the mm -hmm. benefit of those tax credits because another entity owns them but at the end of that uh, that we are able to purchase those those projects so so uh, but it's you know and this is um, an important um, you know, there's an important opportunity to demonstrate that you can have, um, you know, good jobs coming out of this transition to uh, to clean energy and to to renewable energy. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons I think we're excited about the possibility or the the possibilities of of green hydrogen because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that allows us uh, potentially to uh, you know to not necessarily to retain the same assets, but to but to use sort of similar types of assets uh, and and maintain some uh, jobs um, in that in the uh, kind of generation uh, area. But um, but that is you know it is an incredibly important issue, not just for DWP and our ability to go forward with these programs, but for really for the city as a whole. And that is that one of the largest green hydrogen plants by a major utility that was ever announced? I mean, I remember when it came out not too long ago, it really did have quite a splash. Could you speak a little bit to the decision process within LAWDP that got you guys there? Yeah, I think it was a confluence of a couple of things. One is, um, you know, I, I continue uh, 
interest uh, among our stakeholders and our residents in, in not having us be dependent on fossil fuels uh, mm -hmm. given the climate crisis. Um, and the need for, um, you know, which is sort of called dispatchable power. So power that's responsive to the conditions on the grid. Uh, you know, renewable energy uh, is great in a lot of ways, uh, but it has to be managed because, mm -hmm. you know, the intermittency energy. issue yeah. has to be integrated with demand and with right. other things as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So thinking about so you know so in kind of two ways we trying to rid ourselves of fossil fuels to the extent possible and with these long longer term mm -hmm. goals to to get to zero fossil fuels, as well as the need to store energy to manage the grid with the renewables. That um, there's something perfect about. Uh, about the site in Utah. It has all this transmission. It has a power yep. plant there. Yep. It also has salt caverns. It has water. <laughs> um, all things that are, are interesting. Uh, and so the idea is to use the caverns to uh, create hydrogen and store it. Um, and so the idea is that uh, when, um, when there's excess renewable energy on the Western grid, that we can buy that to uh, create the hydrogen, in other words, to electrolyze the hydrogen, okay. so the renewable energy, and then store it uh, in these caverns. And then when we need it, uh, we can uh, run it through the turbines. So the, tech, the, so the third piece of this is really the technology uh, and the technology to uh, run to traditional turbines and new turbines uh, on on first a mix of hydrogen and then a mm -hmm. hydrogen. So we're expecting that uh, by sometime in the mid 2030s that that uh, plant will run on 100% green hydrogen. Um, so it's, I think, a little bit of a unique, um, maybe it's like, what do they call it? A unicorn project. Um, because yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, yeah. I know that people have been talking about this for a long time, but to hear you guys actually wanting to do this, I'm just curious, what are your kind of estimated range of cents per kilowatt hour on, on, on a really experimental and exciting project like that? Um, well, it's uh, so far not, not cheap, um, but... Um, but we, we are- Are we talking like Hawaii price not cheap or <laughs> Vermont price not cheap? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, well, I mean, it will take a lot of investments. Um, I, I, offhand, I can't remember what the cents per kilowatt hour, um, but you know, we already factor in a carbon cost to our mm -hmm. dispatch. Mm -hmm. And so we would expect that that sort of implied cost of carbon will go up over time uh, and make this a, a better better bet. And we're also uh, hoping that uh, some of the, the infrastructure uh, plans uh, that the Biden administration has announced will include some financial assistance to help to help develop this type of cutting edge project yeah, that can really change try. our energy conversations in fundamental ways. Yeah. Right, yeah. and I think there's a lot of excitement about around green hydrogen, uh, but a yep. real need to bring the cost down. And we've seen this with renewable energy. So we can look at some of our early uh, renewable energy projects mm -hmm. and say, well, mm -hmm. we helped to push the market and the technology along, but we're paying a lot for them. But right now our solar projects are coming in cheaper than anything else on the grid, uh, wind as well. Uh, so we're uh, hopeful that for all of the sort of value streams that come along with green hydrogen, that that uh, that we can help move that along so that the technology uh, becomes um, more, uh, you know, more affordable uh, for everybody. Um, and also, uh, Mayor Garcetti last night uh, in the State of the City address talked about um, uh, plans to uh, to bring green hydrogen into the into our uh, what we call our in basin power plants. Okay. Uh, hmm. so, to, uh, so there's a couple of ways that that can happen. Either um, either sort of initially uh, mixing hydrogen into the the gas that natural gas that's delivered mm -hmm. to those mm -hmm. power plants now, or potentially uh, there's a extensive pipeline network under Los Angeles uh, and. Uh, which may be able to deliver uh, green hydrogen di directly to those, to at least one of the power plants. 
One of the, just, just so everyone's on the same page with the LA Power, because we, we, we really appreciate your very, very aggressive goals for, for renewable energy and decarbonization. But if you could just lay us, you know, how big is the system? What percentage of your load is commercial, residential, industrial? Um, and you mentioned now that you're 30 to 5 to 40% renewables. And if you could just break down what those sources of energy are, plus the other sources. Sure. Just to give everyone, get us all on the same page as what yeah. is LAWDP and how much power do you buy from others too, or sell to others? Yeah, so we, um, so LADWP serves uh, just the city of Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. we serve our 4 million residents and businesses. So we have about uh, a million and a half uh, electric customers um, in part because you know, businesses and multifamily dwellings. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and we are about, um, 60% residential, 40% commercial, we don't have wow. too much of an industrial load. Um, but, uh, and, and, and we're more, uh, a majority of our residents live in multifamily uh, units or are renters. Uh, okay. So, so uh, you know, and LA of course is a very diverse city uh, yep. in every possible sense of, uh, sense of the word. Um, so, you know, Trying to make sure that our programs speak to to everybody in the city is is uh, is, is important. Um, as I said, we we generate, transmit, and distribute uh, electricity and, and power in Los Angeles. Uh, mm -hmm. We also are what's called the balancing authority. So okay. We are um, an in sort of an independent um, owner of an operator of uh, our transmission. So we're not part of the California. Right. And you guys and, and SMUD, right? Sacramento Municipal Power are not part of CAISO. Uh, actually, SMUD, I believe. Oh, SMUD is, changed over. Uh, okay. Im okay. Imperial Irrigation District. Imperial, okay. Large, okay. Uh, public yep. power entity in California is, is also uh, not, uh, is, is its okay. own balancing authority. So, uh, so we operate sort of independently of yep. the rest of the California uh, grid. Um, and we really exist to to serve Los Angeles, so we're yep. not really uh, we can we are incidentally involved in the electricity markets in the West, although uh, we just joined something called the Energy Imbalance Imbalance Market, market the EIM. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which is a, a Westwide market, recognizing that uh, you know the the nature of the grid has changed because of the um, increasing penetration of renewables, and so when uh, being able to buy and sell electricity when there's excess uh, renewable energy, either we have available for sale or we can buy it from others when it's available uh, will be really important uh, as we're going forward. And so there's more sort of market evolution coming, uh, but that's a uh, pretty exciting and, and that uh, launched April 1. Are we that's really, uh, yeah. We, our, our participation yeah. in the IM and, and on April 1st. I mean, um, but that, you know, is, I think that is really interesting because it allows you to have a much larger area, geographic area, for thinking about renewables, for thinking about, you know, it's windy over here, not windy over there, sunny right. here, sunny over there, transmission constraint here, not transmission constraint there. And it really allows for a lot more flexibility in managing your resources. Yeah. And we're we're also a large transmission owner. We own, I think, about 20, 20 or 25 percent of the transmission assets owned by any California entity. Um, and our transmission. And, and you're talking high voltage as well as distribution high, network? High voltage and yeah, and lower voltage as well. Okay. Uh, and and we, so we have connections, existing connections all throughout the West up to the Pacific Northwest. Right. Uh, where we've had a longstanding relationship uh, with Bonneville Power Administration mm -hmm. and actually all the way into Canada. Uh, and then, uh, you know, to Utah, uh, supporting the IPP, and then in Arizona and Nevada as well, um, because we used to own uh, fossil generation in those states, but we still own the transmission, which is incredibly valuable. Absolutely, in, um, absolutely. To get renewable energy into the load centers like Los Angeles. Well, I, and I think this is such an interesting conversation because people will often see an organization like LADWP and think just Los Angeles, not recognizing that you really are energy interconnected throughout the West, not only Western United States, but North America. 
And, and I think that story uh, of a utility is one in today's world of uh, variable renewable resources being put on the grid is, is absolutely essential. And I think that organizational structure and kind of knowledge you're going to be bringing to the EIMs will be really interesting for you, but also for the EIM market. So I hope it goes well for you. Yeah, I think it'll be better than, you know, in the past when we needed to buy or sell electricity, we literally had to pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's really old school. It was like the back you would... phone, you know. Think of the back phone. I know that's probably a reference that may be lost. On I get it. I get the that. Right. Folks here, but. Well, and so we spent a little bit of time talking about energy supply. I want to make sure we also talk about um, local generation, but also energy efficiency. Um, I've become more and more um, just aware of the fact of, you know, I'd known for years how hard it is to serve multifamily homes or rental dwellings with energy efficiency programs, in part because the incentives for building upgrade aren't necessarily with the tenant and the, the owner of the buildings might not be interested. Sometimes you have the split incentives where, you know, I pay for the utilities, but you own the heaters and the insulation um, incentives. And so how do your energy efficiency programs in LA begin to address some of those split incentives and how do you ensure that all benef all, all customers of, of, of LADWP are able to actually benefit from the programs? Yeah, no, it's an uh, important question. So I, I, I kind of think of our energy efficiency programs in sort of three buckets. Okay. Uh, the first bucket is just the sort of incentive slash rebate. So mm -hmm. do something that saves energy, we, we pay you an incentive. Uh, so our incentives are pretty generous uh, for our large commercial customers, I think mm -hmm. 24, 25 cents a kilowatt hour uh, worth of energy savings. So it makes a lot of things uh, cost effective. Uh, and um, I should say overall, our approach is to look at a, a, a portfolio of programs mm -hmm, so that the mm -hmm. program does not have to be cost effective in and of itself, as long as the portfolio is, is cost effective, and, mm -hmm. and it is. Uh, and so the mix helps us ensure that that's the case. Uh, we also have a number of direct install programs. Um, uh, so we have some that are aimed specifically at small and medium-sized commercial customers where we'll basically come in and, well, we have contractors who work mm -hmm. for us who are mm -hmm. uh, all union contractors. Uh, and will come in and um, for free, do a bunch of energy efficiency upgrades uh, for free small. for the small and medium business, not free for LAW, no, no, not LADWP, for right, for right. LADWP. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we'll just come in and do those. And same, we have similar uh, type of program aimed at, uh, about, at uh, uh, residential customers. So we have an existing program that primarily uh, serves single family homes, but does mm -hmm. also uh, serve uh, multifamily units and actually uh, the mayor talked about it a little bit yesterday in the state of the city, but we we will shortly uh, be announcing a big expansion uh, of that program, uh, particularly aimed at uh, what we're calling uh, weatherization in uh, mm -hmm. multifamily uh, dwellings, primarily in disadvantaged communities. So uh, that's coming uh, in the next six weeks or so. Uh, and then and then we also uh, so we have rebates, incentives, mm -hmm. direct install. And then we are also big proponents of just free stuff uh, because um, a lot of our community is hard to reach. Um, and so just giving stuff away helps. So for um, probably about the last 15 years, we've had a refrigerator giveaway program. Um, so uh, for low-income customers um, where, because you know a big energy using appliance yep. like a refrigerator, uh, people don't replace them until they break. Right, uh, and, and they older, last a long time. They last a long time, and older units are just much less energy efficient than new new refrigerators. So we found that it was just cost effective to just buy somebody a new refrigerator. And so, I mean, we give away literally thousands of refrigerators every year. Um, we also did, um, we've done three, I think three, uh, uh, LED light bulb distributions to every household in the city. Uh, so we distributed two LED light bulbs to every household in the city. Um, so, you know, and, and that program turns out to be very cost effective because mm -hmm. that, you know, again, trying to 
focus on where people really use energy um, and where they won't do something unless you kind of give it a, give it away. Uh, so people don't replace their light bulbs till the light bulb goes out. Uh, but we give them a reason to, to do that. So, so those are uh, foundationally. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to as much as possible to remove mm -hmm. that sort of split incentive to, to make it cost effective for both the uh, building owner and the, and the, and the tenant to, uh, to do energy efficiency. Um, we've also funded um, over about the last dozen years, um, community-based organizations to help get the word out. Um, because it is such a diverse city, and we really, yeah. um, we we are not good. We are not great at uh, necessarily meeting people where they are. But there are a lot of really good community-based organizations in Los Angeles who are, and so we work with them to uh, deliver energy efficiency and water conservation programs directly to people that they serve. Um, you know, one place we're sort of challenged is uh, we do have some existing low uh, low income discounts um, for mm -hmm. our low income customers, but we're really constrained by um, some voter uh, uh, voter voter initiatives or referendums in California that limited the ability of local government to to uh, raise revenue. Um, and we sort of got caught up in both of the propositions, 218 and 26, uh, which put some real constraints um, on sort of how we can structure our rates uh, and make it difficult for us to provide discounts to certain classes of customers that are not available to everyone. Does that only affect you as a municipal utility or is that affecting all just municipal oh, utilities. And you're one of the largest municipal utilities in the country. Absolutely. If not the so, largest. Yeah, we are, we are the, lar we are the, the largest. largest uh, right. Of the 2,200 munis in the country, you guys are number one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, yes, it only affects uh, public agencies. OK. Uh, so it really gets on. Uh, so you know, folks may remember Prop 13, which was a limit yep. on uh, local government ability to raise property taxes. Basically so, gutted the school systems in California. That was, <laughs> and then it was followed about twenty years later by Proposition Two Eighteen because okay. uh, the same folks uh, who sponsored Prop Thirteen said local governments are getting around this by by coming up with fees uh, and 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 sort of put a uh, um, put constraints on yeah. property related fees. Hmm. Uh, the, that does not apply to electricity; it applies to water. And then Prop. Proposition 26, which is probably not even 10 years old yet, which said that uh, any fees uh, charged by any uh, by any public agency uh, mm -hmm. can only be based on cost, and you can't um, have one class of customers subsidizing another. Uh, so there's uh, it's still relatively new, but um, we are already we kept lawsuits already on our rates uh, based on Proposition 26. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I, yeah, I don't think many people realize that how closely rate making is social policy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how we make rates determines, you know, how we value programs like energy efficiency, but also how we think people should pay for energy. Is energy a right or is energy a luxury? And at what point does that change? Yeah. Nancy, so can I, can I ask you? To, just, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not energy, but water. Uh, so California has a human right to water law. Yeah. Uh, but it also has this constraints on on um, on so the ability to 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 raise and spend money. Um, and and most water agencies uh, in California are, are publicly owned. About right. Less than right. twenty percent of people in California are served by private. Get water from private companies, so it's a real it's a real problem, and it's really hit our low income programs particularly. Um, it's made it particularly difficult. So our approach has been basically to say, if it was in place before Proposition Twenty Six, we are freezing it and saying okay. we're grandfathered. Um, that has not gone through the courts yet, uh, and we're hopeful that that will hold, um, but we don't know. One of the things I've appreciated from some of the young scholars um, like Tony Reams at University of Michigan, who's done a great job of evaluating 
who actually benefits from a lot of utility programs. His work in Detroit looked at who actually got the energy efficiency incentives. And you could see the same type of research going out for the solar incentives or the electric vehicle incentives, just thinking about this equity and justice and access question for our different utility programs. From LADWP's perspective, how do you evaluate um, this equity consider consideration in your program rollout and in who's benefiting from the, the, the different types of incentives and programs you have, be it the rooftop solar, be it the efficiency programs, be it any others? Yeah, I think in a couple of ways. First of all, um, one of the things we realized about five years ago was um, we actually had no idea. You know, we 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 rolled out programs, uh, we but we didn't do the analysis on the other end. Uh, mm -hmm. to see who I was. think I think a lot of people are guilty of this, right? It's not it's not LADWP is not unique here. Yeah. So uh, so we decided we needed to do that. Actually, our our board of uh, water and power commissioners mm -hmm. said um, you need to start to analyze this. So really across a number of measures, uh, a number of programs to really measure the impact. Um, so we started something called the Equity Data Metrics Initiative, which is like mm -hmm. the worst possible name for something, uh, <laughs> mostly because it's a mouthful. Um, uh, it's not catchy, uh, but it but it does really, you know, so we've looked at uh, all, a whole set of measures from, mm -hmm. from things around reliability. So how many outages we have and duration of outages uh, and then to to our programs. The, the other, uh, of course, um, constraint in California because of Proposition 209 is we can't really collect data based on race. Um, right. And so um, we have used more geographic screens. So uh, something called Cal Enviro Screen, uh, which is a tool that was developed by uh, the state of California, uh, California, uh, California Environmental Protection Agency to try mm -hmm. to identify uh, disadvantaged and and uh, pollution burden communities. Uh, so mm -hmm. we use, so we 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 uh, sort of map our programs uh, across uh, Cal Enviro Screen to get a sense of. Uh, of, of some of the equity dimensions um, of these programs. And so, so we've collected the information and now we're sort of um, making sure that our programs are reaching people um, given, the, you know, given some of the other constraints. So for example, um, you know, solar is one, I think it's a lot of attention. It always gets a lot of attention. Yeah, in that, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you have to own a home, you have to be able to afford to put on the panels and right. and that and we have been providing an incentive as utilities across California had uh, for people to put the roof, uh, solar on their rooftop mm -hmm. uh, and so we we've designed a couple of programs to try to expand the uh, the access to the to solar uh, one was to to lease people's roofs and mm -hmm. basically pay them uh, to put solar panels on and we lease the roof and um, it turned out that uh, there were a lot of roofs in LA that are not capable of supporting solar panels. And I've lived in some of those houses. Yeah, <laughs> people are replacing, it doesn't rain here, so people don't right. replace their roofs. So uh, uh, so we're looking at actually whether we can pay people, basically pay them to replace their roofs, but uh, that might be coming. Um, but also looking at community solar, so shared solar, so right, have, have right. solar program, uh, which we will be expanding uh, to allow, you know, uh, either apartment dwellers or people who can't mm -hmm. afford to put solar on their rooftop um, to to participate in, in solar. Subscribe uh, to programs or buy into programs that are at a rate that allows them to participate in renewable energy and benefit from it, but not having to have the same infrastructure available. Yeah, and similarly, when we look at, for example, electric vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, we provide a, a very generous incentive for the installation of electric vehicle chargers it basically covers the cost of the charger, either for residents or for commercial uh, customers, which include multifamily dwellings. Uh, and uh, and we've actually, um, because we, it's a long story, but we, yeah. we, we pay for it with the proceeds of a program that's not ratepayer money. So it doesn't okay. run into some of the uh, Prop 26 issues and 218 issues. Uh, uh, we, are, we put a kicker in for disadvantaged communities. So you actually get, uh, thousand dollars more per charger if you install them in disadvantaged communities so we've seen that um, that that's been super helpful and then you know trying to address um, 
equity around electrification, also helping to support um, the electrification of the transit fleets. Um, right, right, so, that's huge. Yeah, so both the LA Metro, which is the regional provider mm -hmm. of transit, as well as uh, the LA City Department of Transportation, which provides a short line buses uh, called dash buses. Uh, both of those are going 100% electric, uh, hopefully by the Olympics, by 2028. Um, so we're helping to support that. And of course, the build out of the transit system in LA, uh, you know, voters approved the largest uh, transit um, funding measure in, in anywhere uh, ever uh, to build out transit in LA County. Um, and so we will, you know, we, we support that through the expansion of our infrastructure. And how do you see climate change and adaptation fitting into these plans? I mean, we're even talking about this in, in Northern New England where we're expecting more intense rainfall and more intense droughts. And could you tell us a little bit about what those climate projections say for the LA basin and how you at LAWDP are thinking about this adaptation story that's going to also go along with the mitigation story? Sure, I mean, we've been um, fortunate to, uh, uh, nothing against Dartmouth, but we, we have a number of really excellent uh, re uh, re research institutions in Los Angeles. Uh, Absolutely. So we've been actually working with, uh, particularly with UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they've been helping us to downscale the climate models to look mm -hmm. at directly on Los Angeles and actually on our water system. Um, and so, you know, when we look at climate adaptation, we think about, I mean, three sort of primary issues. One is increased heat, mm -hmm. uh, so the urban heat island effect, as well as just the increase in demand for electricity because it's going to be hotter in Los Angeles. It's getting hotter in Los Angeles and it'll be hotter in Los Angeles. And that has huge implications for us. Um, right. For the folks from LA, you know, a lot of houses that were built in the 50s and 60s were built without air conditioning. Uh, that's not true anymore. And every time somebody renovates a home in LA, they put air conditioning in. Yep. So yep. See those loads increase. Uh, without air conditioning and without insulation. And those without two. Insulation, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we are funding insulation programs mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then the, the second um, is, is really around wildfire, which, which is sort right. of connected to the third, which the is heat. the change in the hydrological cycle, mm -hmm. which is both an impact for our water system uh, and availability of water, as well as having a direct impact on fire. Um, so, you know, uh, wildfire, um, it really is about hardening this, the system. Um, I'm actually very interested, uh, and we were talking to um, some researchers potentially about how do we use natural systems? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we enhance natural systems? I mean, we do mitigation projects when we do capital projects we, we, under California, the California Environmental Quality Act, you have to mm -hmm. mitigate environmental impacts. So we do a fair amount of mitigation. Um, so looking at, you know, how do we strengthen habitats and strengthen the ecosystems to be more potentially more fire resistant, uh, but, you know, dealing with wildfire, both for our power imports, um, as well as the system within the city. Um, we have less of Los Angeles is at high fire risk than some of our neighbors, uh, just right. a densely populated urban area without that much open space, but we do have areas in the city that are, are vulnerable. And your grid and is all over the West. So your grid West, exposure so. is... Yeah, so there was a fire a um, couple of years ago uh, in October, I think it's 2018, that uh, was not in Los Angeles, uh, was close to Los Angeles. And uh, we have to shut down our big transmission lines that right. um, bring the imported renewable energy into Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we lost it for uh, over 24 hours. We lost three quarters of our import capability. Uh, so it's, it's a big deal. Um, and that's when, um, you know, it's gotten a lot of attention in California, but, uh, you know, in both, so we, we, we're looking at both hardening our transmission system as well as the distribution. So in the neighborhoods, um, you know, about, uh, about a third of our system is undergrounded. So primarily okay. the most densely populated parts of the city, but uh, and undergrounding is 
is very expensive uh, and, yes. and, and but there's some side effects to it uh, in terms of operating the grid that, it, you know, it's not a panacea necessarily, uh, but, but an, important, an important tool. Um, and then really trying to deal with heat. Um, so both um, dealing with the increasing load. Uh, so energy efficiency helps any, you right. know, helps in so many ways. Uh, but also we've, we've for a long time funded cool roof programs mm -hmm. uh, and supported other uh, programs in the city. Um, we, 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 the primary um, provider of funding for the city's tree planting program, um, hmm. the energy efficiency benefits of that. We've done that for, uh, we've had a tree program for probably 20 years. Um, so, uh, so really trying to be comprehensive um, but, but obviously more to do there. I wanted to make sure that our audience was able, if you have a question to type it into the chat. Um, I, I mean, this is a great conversation. And for me, what you've really woven together are not only how you got there and what your goals are, but also thinking about meeting these goals in an environment that a lot of your infrastructure isn't designed for. And so the challenge facing you is enormous, both in terms of you know, just meeting the goals is a huge task, but doing it while you're also dealing with the heat, with the wildfires, potentially with islanding and ensuring reliability in a place where you may or may not have your some of your major transmission lines working. I mean, it's, it, it's changing the system in fundamental ways while adapting the system to a world that we may not understand that well. Yeah, and you know, one non-climate related risk that of course we're always planning for is earthquakes. Um, absolutely so absolutely it does turn out that uh, i think most of what we would do to be prepared to deal with an earthquake will help us in our climate adaptation not that there's necessarily a link between earthquakes and climate right, but right. The kinds of stresses on our system uh, mm -hmm. and our residents um, islanding or being able to provide power the sensing in the networks the ability to think about critical structures and services to communities to ensure people are safe after an event yeah, so for example, we've been working with the city's Department of uh, Recreation and Parks on creating mm -hmm. cooling, uh, cooling centers as, as sort of uh, uh, resilience hubs. Uh, so, um, you know, every summer we end up activating cooling centers for people who don't have air conditioning and really yep. trying to make sure those are, are resilient and can, can function in case of an interruption in the grid. So things like, um, things like, microgrids. Uh, so we're trying to focus it on on sort of public infrastructure, um, uh, you know, to, to help all of our residents. I know that a lot of people who don't work in the energy space don't appreciate how full contact, interdisciplinary, and innovative it is. But just for our audience here, could you sketch out for us where you see some of the future challenges and future opportunities for an organization like LADWP? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the, it, you know, dealing with uh, changes, you know, the changes brought by climate change are going to be huge, uh, trying to do our part. I mean, we represent something like 98% of the sort of corporate in uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the city of Los Angeles. Um, and we have a huge influence on, on overall the community's mm -hmm. uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and emission reduction. So a zero carbon grid enables us to make major um, progress in decarbonizing both transportation and buildings. And so, for example, um, the biggest source regional source of air pollution in the LA basin are the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach right, right. and the goods movement, the freight movement associated with them. So the, not just the ships coming in, but the things unloading the ships and then distributing the cargo literally all over the United States. And our communities bear the pollution burden of that. Yep. Uh, and both ports have plans to get to, to sort of zero emission ports. Uh, well, that's going to primarily, although not exclusively, be through electrification. So we've got to work with the, the Port of Los Angeles. So we don't serve the Port of Long Beach, uh, but we have to, you know, work with this, uh, um, the Port of Los Angeles to, to make their electrification um, plans possible and to really get to that uh, source of air pollution. 
I have two questions here and I'll pose them both at once because I know we're a little bit short on time. Um, the first was the community, how do community based organizations plug into some of your work? You mentioned it in the um, space of giving out uh, light bulbs and other stuff, but maybe there's some other examples too. And then the other was how is LADWP engaging with the Tongva folks on projects pertaining to the LA River and overall water resources across the county? Yeah, so, uh, and, the, and the first question, so, yeah, I mean, we work directly with a number of community-based organizations. We help, we, we provide them funding to help us uh, to really reach out to folks about, about opportunities for energy conservation, water conservation, uh, and a number of other, uh, a number of other things. So we do support a lot of community efforts, uh, and, we, for and we work closely with stakeholders. Um, uh, Los Angeles, the city created something called a, a climate emergency mobilization office, uh, which is which is actually housed in the Department of Public Works, uh, but is is really uh, aimed at giving uh, environmental justice a voice in everything that the city does. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's new. Uh, it started in January, so we're working with them, and they're doing a lot of a stakeholder outreach uh, on behalf of the city as a whole, but also. Uh, working with them. So we're trying to find all those opportunities to do that. Um, and then on the on the Tongva, um, so we actually have uh, tribal engagement policies. Uh, and we also, um, uh, under uh, state law, um, we're actually re absolutely required to do tribal uh, outreach on all of our CEQA projects and all of our CEQA analysis. Uh, so our California Environmental Quality uh, environmental analysis uh, requires tribal consultation, uh, and and that applies to the city as well, uh, not just us. So, uh, so we regularly reach out to tribes both in the LA Basin and particularly uh, in the Eastern Sierra, where we we have major water operations as well, and there are a number of uh, tribes there as well. So, uh, I, I, I know we can do more, but uh, but we're we got this tribal engagement policy in place. We actually have a tribal advisor, um, and, uh, who who helps us uh, make sure we're um, doing what what we should be doing uh, with respect to the tribes, as well as engaging direct consultation and um, and uh, we also you know uh, work with tribes. Uh, as contractors to do to, to tribal uh, cultural resource protection when we're doing uh, projects both in the basin and, and up in the eastern sea as well. Nancy, thank you so much for today. It's really important, I think, for people around the country to appreciate how broad LADWP is in its engagement on sustainability, its engagement with its lands, and how its footprint is beyond the LA County and really out uh, across the West. And through the projects you have, through your engagements with those communities, um, I think we can all appreciate some of the challenges and opportunities that are facing you and all of us in the decades to come. So I really wanna thank you for your um, engagement with us today. You've really helped to contextualize a lot of the energy system pieces of the story. And I'll turn it over to Kate to talk about the next sessions in this series. Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you so much, Nancy, for that amazing conversation. You really covered a lot of ground and, and got into the weeds as well as, you know, you know, touching on a lot of different areas that are relevant to LADWP's work. So thank you. Um, the next event of the series is this Thursday at the same time, and that's gonna feature um, Dignity and Power Now, the Anti-Recidivism Coalition and Felon to Freeman, who are three organizations that are all working on um, building coalitions against police power. Um, and that conversation is gonna be a, a sort of like round robin Q&A that'll be moderated by Professor Ivy Schweitzer from Dartmouth. Um, so we hope to see you there. Um, future events are, are on our website and we, uh, as you know, are sending out periodic emails with information about future events. So I don't wanna keep you all for longer than you signed up for. So thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.